Welcome to CRTV, where cartoon drawing reviews TV shows. I've been thinking a lot lately about a show that was huge for its time, a merchandising phenomenon, and now remembered by nobody. This one. The 80s experiment of energetic engine excellence, the Dukes of Hazard. It's virtually impossible that you don't know the car, the name, the horn, or of course... I love every second of this seven-season southern slab of slick auto action and wholesome ham-fisted morals of being a good person, lending a helping hand, and fighting the system. While flying around in an orange charger, like a confederate cannon full of oranges. Speaking of which... Way back in 1865, there was this little conflict going on in our beautifully united country of ours called the Civil War. And the Confederacy got handed a monumentally fat L. The world is mine, nigga, get back. Don't fuck with my stack. That might be taking it a little too far back, so moving ahead past Honest Abe slapping the shit out of the South to the 1975 film Moonrunners. Entirely forgotten today, it was the pebble that snowballed into the show we eventually got, telling the tale of a southern family who derby race and run moonshine, the same booze that makes rubbing alcohol taste like candy. Mm. Writer-director Guy Waldron, along with actual ex-shiner Jerry Rushing, Where's he going? The two whipped up this little movie that, in hindsight, serves as a feature-length test reel of Hazard, down to several concepts, characters, and actors being ripped directly from this one into the other. That's Cooter. He follows Ebo everywhere. In 77, Waldron got the offer of a lifetime when Warner Brothers came a-knockin' with the offer to develop this weird niche movie into a primetime TV show. So the opposite of chips. Yeah. That was after they agreed to tone down some of the more raunchy and risque bits, before the show would actually ditch all of its grit for episodes with aliens and shit. But we'll get there. Who was that guy? Jerry Rushing wound up with the short end of the dashboard, however, having to sue WB for essentially stealing his life story without credit and serving as the template for an alleged 13 characters from the Duke's universe. The show captured the hearts and minds of audiences across the airwaves, dominating the rankings and without a doubt cashing in on that wicked Warner merchandising. We're in the money, we're in the money. We've got a lot of what it takes to get along. They've even stated that the General Lee got more fan mail than any other character, which is hysterical and horrible. But before I knew anything about its peak, plummet, perseverance, and eventual suppression, there was just a young me, some Midwest madman, with a pile of DVDs and a toy car, watching this insanely absurd show day in and day out. Here, this ought to do it. Luke, I sure hope you got a pilot's license. So I'm going to go through and review each episode, ranking them all in the season while simultaneously scripting the full series list. Which will duke out the dubious docket of every single episode. Who knows, maybe even some of my top 10 have changed. Fill up your blinker fluid and don't touch that dial as we reminisce on the revered revving of a few hot-footed hunks and a whole group of Georgia gents. This is the Dukes of Hazard Season 1. Our very first episode begins, how else? Welcome to Hazard County. This is the Balladeer, played by Waylon Jennings. Or if this real definition is too much for you, he's our smooth-talking, interjecting narrator that guides the story along, and slides in and out of commercial breaks. 
Ain't that pretty, a hanging there like that? Now y'all stick around, because we'll be getting on with it in a minute. Now, if this is your first Duke's dichotomy, this is really the litmus test on whether or not you'll be able to handle the rest of this nonsensical neutrality. The cop car is the one being chased. Buckle up, this place is as close to fantasy as it gets without being too ridiculous. Yet. Bo and Luke Duke, played by Tom Wopat and John Schneider, are the base of the show. These two have infectious chemistry, and you immediately realize their relationship. Kin closer and stronger than Steel. I don't have friends. I got family. They catch the cop, who is actually the town mechanic, Cooter Davenport, played by Ben Jones. His grungy exterior and pig pen grown up gusto isn't a mirror of his actual self. He's kind, loyal, strong, and practically the third Duke boy. Anyway, he stole the sheriff's car, who is smuggling in slot machines to Hazard to suck up more revenue. Which reminds me, this show is, how do I say, formulaic with its plots. This whole charade is just an excuse to do cool car cravats. So I've made these counters, and I'll try to log as we go. I may add a few more if I find them too. Speaking of which, we quickly establish the Mafia Don of Duke debunking and Donut demolishing, Jefferson Davis Boss Hogg, played by the late Sorrel Book. He's one lean, mean, extra thick rattlesnake that'll be the hero's foil from henceforth, and he'll remain adorable the entire way. We also meet the Hazard Sheriff, Head of Law Enforcement, Roscoe P. Coltrane, portrayed by James Best. His name sums it all up. He's the perfect bumbling buffoon that's just competent enough to believably be duped by the Dukes time and again. Hang on, cousin. Also, it'll become much more apparent in later seasons, but this first one is far more realistic in its portrayal of characters and circumstances. He got a rake off from moonshine, contraband, and even portable prostitution in two cruise and RV campers. Not only was it actually shot in the state it's set before shifting to California, but it was a lot more mature and bold. Well, at least two of them kids at that orphanage could be yours. <laughs> this will disappear entirely at a certain point as the show strived for a broader family-friendly reach, and I think that's why this first early batch of episodes is so exciting. And while we're on the topic of titillating television, we drive over to a staple location, the Boar's Nest, to see the sexiest slinger of cocktails and cock kicks, Daisy Duke. Damn! Played by Katherine Bach. Um... Is this where the shorts come from? Yes, this is where the shorts come from, and seeing her made cut in my shorts. I'm sorry. They meet up with Cooter and a bunch of random dudes we'll never see again. <laughs> as they drift around a junkyard and foreshadow the remake. Burt Reynolds never seems to get lost. He's got a mustache. Plus, a little Starsky and Hutch Gran Torino cameo never hurt. They scope out the slew of slots and use the oldest trick in the distraction handbook besides keys in front of cats. Raise them high and don't turn around. Now you all promised me you wouldn't bring machine guns. Machine guns? Lord have mercy. Good luck, fellas. The next day, it doesn't even take a whole rotation for the slots to be found by Uncle Jesse, played by the late, great Denver Pyle. He found them. You were supposed to get the eggs. Well, I thought you were. He comes right out of the rip wrangling in the rascals and an earned respect fitting of such a perfect patriarch. Man, don't go selling them at a profit. I love this guy. Now with Daisy, we get this iconic shot and she chases around the bar parking lot before being booked and pulling a piano's perfect pitch. It does allow for Uncle Jesse to act circles around everyone, insisting family is fucking crucial. Now get her out. The last of our long-term players for this episode is Enos, the boy next door that's incredibly naive as the most gullible goofball to grab a gun. Wrong side, me! Played by Sonny Schroyer. He's head over boots for Daisy and will continue to be in the fed zone for the rest of the show. They flawlessly break her out of the pen. And 
Union showcase a booming police force that'll be whittled down to a reckless two or three in the next episode. The thing that won't be cut down, though, is the jumps. That right there was the very first General Lee leap ever captured on film. It's nice to know this OG car was once found and restored. You can collect all five cars and create your own Hazard County with the Dukes of Hazard Happy Meal at McDonald's. Wrapping up one-armed bandits, they roll around the town square, see a second general in this blatant continuity error. Roscoe is led into the party just for him, who was being re-elected, but it doesn't matter. The orphanage bow's B-plot boning he attempts is saved. And a stern stogie sees us off. This episode is still one of my all-time favorites and drops us into hazard with little fuss or confusion. There was clearly something special here. Episode 2 begins with the three boys becoming aware of a song Daisy wrote and sent in for publishing that's now on the radio sung by some old lady I don't listen to. It's Jesse Coulter! It's clear Daisy's been scammed, proving it was possible way before that crypto crap. You think Daisy's been took? They load up the lovely Lee and meet up with this sleazy music mogul, Mr. Star. Get out of here, I'm very busy. Look, mister, if you're not gonna be fair about this... He's a prick. You're gonna need help, Hoss. He's got it. And it doesn't go well. They boomerang back, beat up the bastard, boss happens to be up there and splits, and there's a raid. Cops! Cops! Outside, it's a raid! A raid! So with the boys on probation, they've obviously got to get out, and do so in the only way they know how. That's our boys. We find out this star is as shady as most of them, and his gimmick is contracting soundalikes of famous artists to trick idiots, I guess. So as we've already mentioned, they send in Daisy for a devious distraction. And sex sells. And I want to be a star. Oh, and they save the day. Another personal favorite of mine but below the previous. This is a weird one. For the most obvious, this is the only episode of the show where the General Lee doesn't even appear. It's never stated where it is, only that the 75 Plymouth is Cooters, but if anyone has the answers, let me know on my socials or send a carrier pigeon. It's also the only one where Roscoe shoots someone, plus he has bitchin' theme music. Bo and Luke have to protect an unborn baby from a mob boss who's after her six-figure trust fund. It's not very good. Moonshine. Moonshine? Moonshine. As long as I get my money back. Maybe the worst of the season. With our race car returned, we introduce another upcoming side character, Boss's wife Lulu, played by Peggy Ree. She does a ton of blabbering about her birthday car that just so happens to be in the care of criminals who plan to use it as a high-end hiding place, with diamonds and stuff. This logically leads to the boys being contracted to repo the Rolls Royce, and it goes... You know, Luke, I think that made him mad. Oh. Great. It's got classic written over the whole episode. Cooter finally shows how important he is to the whole operation. More mention of the boys' probation. Now, you boys have broken probation. That's gonna get you two years in prison. Read them the rights, Enos. Y'all, y'all have the right to remain quiet. Bad guy beat-ups. <laughs> Roscoe speaks on how easy it is to become corrupted when your pension is stripped away after a career of rocking the straight and narrow. Daisy's a badass, and it's currently rocking the third spot. What do you think old Burt Reynolds will do in a time like this?
After entering a contest for a newfound fossil fuel, Boss Hog plans to pin Jesse and the boys when they enter with moonshine as their gas, the very thing that put Bo and Luke on probation, and the thing Jesse swore off to keep the boys free. Please stand back, this is a federal arrest. You pulling a gun on me, lady? Roscoe, along with the boys' new female fed. Hey, Daisy! Stay out of here, Bo! Roxanne's naked as a jaybird! Are both trying to catch the trio with the sour sauce. Jesse even has to bust out Tilly, a legendary... <laughs> This is so stupid. Jesse even has to bust out Tilly, a supposed legendary set of wheels that our collective uncle has had many a moonshine runs inside. It's better than Mary Kate's baby and below Repo Man. Jesse Duke, what the heck are you doing here? Baba Booey. Episode six starts with a superb explosion. Ain't we off to a good start? And we see Swamp Molly, an old family friend of Uncle Jesse. As it appears, Jay Money owes Molly a life debt, Chewbacca style. And she brings along her cousin Alice. She's played by Mary Jo Collette, and while she may be unrecognizable in her current greasy state, she's most infamous as the housekeeper from Different Strokes and voices everyone's favorite puffy-fished boating instructor. Everyone will know that I let him slide through school. I got me a new book on wrestling holds and ain't nobody to practice on except the bear. I'll have to move to a new city, start a new boating school with a new name. But that's about where the interest ends. Also going on is Bo and Luke taking a delivery of, you guessed it, moonshine. They really like this stuff. The twist on this canonical cone is that it's actually firearms. And if you aren't a lawyer like yours truly, probation plus guns equals completely fucked. They run. Daisy sets some Home Alone-like oil slick traps. Roscoe calls the friggin' FBI. Should that one count for the series tally of criminals and hazard? FBI, open up! They manage to figure it out. <laughs> Better than episode three, but worse than high octane. It's time for the annual Hazard Derby, because cars! With no rules and a hefty prize pool of 500 cold, hard, car-crashing cash, it's Enos, Cooter, Bo, and <gasps> a woman? Amy Creeby, Classic County Powder Puff Division. Hey, he's a she. Good for her. This one's got it all. Criminals coming in, causing chaos. Boss Hog trying to get his piggy fingers into the prize money. Bo teaming up with a gal that sounds like a rejected newsy. I can strip your lug nuts, Junior. And Luke being the one in love for a change. <laughs> also, a UFC card full of fight scenes with all kinds of wacky props and locations. <laughs> The derby itself is a lot of fun and showcases a bunch of fantastic stunt work. This one shoots all the way up to third place. This one starts with four show staples nearly back to back. Boss stealing money from the town as the judge, using illegal moonshine money while criminal scum scrounge up as Roscoe does sheriff business. However, after the bad guy dips into the general, the boys look guiltier than a hot box full of Kentucky dicks or some shit. <laughs> That's the Duke boys! Their innocence goes south as the bandit bolts with their beloved baby by himself, only to wind up at the boar's nest with Daisy putting Boss's stolen money in the back of Uncle Jesse's pickup. Mighty sorry about that. All right, just show him. Show just him. Well, I found this money in the back seat of the General Lee. Safe to say that even with that series of unfortunate events, they're still off to jail just the same. Real sorry about this, Enos. You would really mean that, buddy.
What makes this episode spicier than most of the previous ones is the shaking up of established ideas while maintaining consistency. Daisy is taken hostage at first, then jumps behind the wheel of the O-1 and does some wicked tricks. Now they do that! Bo and Luke bust out of jail effortlessly, but then have to get crafty with staying out. Here, get out of the way, I'm gonna hit you. Shoot you! Oh, I am gonna hit him! Also, Boss loses his liquor lemmings. I'll put it above Swamp Molly and under High Octane. Yahoo! So if you want to fly and do stunts like real with cars that got the look and the recent deal, you get the Dukes of Hazzard racing set, which is from ID. The G-Dang president of the United States is strolling through Hazard, or at least his limo is. If this season is set in the same year of release, 1978, that'd make the current prez Jimmy Carter, by the way. I'd be president just to ride in that thing. On the topic of freedom, there's only three American certainties. Death, taxes, and cool cars are always at risk of being stolen for joyrides. 80, 90, 100, 100. <laughs> Being able to say you stole the car of the highest job on the planet is totally something I put above my own name on my resume. So yeah, the boys get involved through osmosis, I guess, jumping around and creating chaos for everyone. Boss Hogg is also trying to retrieve the car with the help of this illegal chop shop, run by Charles Cyphers? I ain't never chopped no president's limousine. That's right, horror fiends, the same year Charles took up the badge as Sheriff Brackett in my favorite scary movie. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare, huh? This motherfucker was in Duke's Hazard too. Small world, but not small enough as some convenient crooks come by to help get Bo, Luke, Daisy, and Cooter all together for some fun. This was the moment on my rewatch where I realized that it was around here where the show started to find a consistent groove to lead us into the series' golden age. You know, I wish I'd have had y'all take your boots off before I agreed to this. Liked it more than the big heist and less than high octane. We're immediately dropped in on some screeching, smooching, and supposed skinny dipping. Kinda looks like the bank's gonna make a withdrawal from the customers, don't it? Those weren't the only things that just got cocked. Nah, but once the boys escape in their clothless car, they instantly smack into Roscoe and get stripped of their freedom once again. At the same time, Boss Hogg and Roscoe get informed of a big-time bad guy who just had his court appearance swapped to where else. Only problem is, neither of the two morally mute maniacs want to go get the goons themselves, so we get the first of many plots involving the Duke family going against their very DNA fibers and joining the cold hands of the corrupt law force. Well, one take. <laughs> It's basically the TV equivalent of Al Capone joining the Neighborhood Watch. Shit just doesn't make any sense. What does make sense for this world is the second Cooter and Enos see the boys in blue, they jump behind the wheel together to get a better look. Anyways, they head over, seeing Norman Aldean, who fans of mine will recognize from They Live and Back to the Future, who hands over this roided-out Hannibal Lecter-looking lunatic. Should be an interesting trip. Hold that thought. Luke, I sure hope you got a pilot's license. <laughs> no, not that. But for the big midpoint twist, this lady cop isn't the lady cop and is in fact an imposter trying to get her revenge on Rocky. But who cares about that when Jesse chews Boss out for being a janky judge? You mean to tell me you sent those two boys out to bring back a man like Rocky Marlowe unarmed? Oh. And they equip the cavalry to save their badge-bound behinds. It's all wrapped up nicely, even screwing Boss out of the court publicity. 
I had completely forgotten this episode, and now it's my third favorite of the season so far. This one starts with the footage that'll go on to be the show's end credit footage from this point onward. More exciting than that fizzled out fun fact is Boss attempting to weasel out sending back one million bucks to the Federal Reserve for burning. Oh, and we're introduced to Boss's cousin Cletus, played by Rick Hurst. Remember this pudgy patrolman, he'll return to the show eventually. Didn't even realize he was introduced so early on. So literally seconds after Cletus leaves with the single bound singles, he just tosses some TNT into the truck. This obviously goes haywire when Bo and Luke extinguish the situation, so Boss decides to just frame them for stealing the money instead. Seems that uh, Boss Hogg wanted me to drop by and just thank the boys for putting out that fire in his armored truck. How'd they manage to hide that clean Millie so fast? Well, well, let's... Ooh, 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 look at that! Green coffee! <laughs> Lock it in here, folks. This is probably the slickest Roscoe and Co. are for the remainder of the show. After the two run, they find Cooter painting more Boss Moonshine Mobiles. He's got about four or five of these things he uses to run that old moonshine up to Nashville. And he, with Daisy's duping, helped them on their never-ending innocence escapade. That turkey wants to play chicken! <laughs> this one's good, not great, and is right around the middle of the placement. First of all, no, this one's not about the crew taking down an evil convenience store chain. But instead, the boys swapping the general for something with a few more wheels. It is an 18-wheeler. Well, there's two of us. That's nine wheels piece. <laughs> that is, coincidentally, a rolling casino. And since Boss can sniff crooked currency from several area codes away, he too wants to get in on the action and hopefully slap Bo and Luke in the slammer. Listen, we got enough stuff here for Boss and I to start our own casino. <laughs> not only are they way more concerned with helping out Dewey, Dewey, get out of there. That's not your family. Get his lost fun back from Helen, played by Joanne Flug. P F F uh, Fug. Pug? No, not Pug. Fug. I'm sorry. That's a bad name. Yeah. She is most known to me from the MASH movie and playing Big Jack on The Fall Guy. Oh yeah, they solved the caper and contained the compromised cash. It was pretty good. Anybody here sent for a taxi cab? <laughs> The season finale flies out of the gate swinging with some random asshole running the General Lee off the road. Add a stranger or two that look like they're up to no good. Back at the boar's nest, the young and the restless wrestle it out until landing everyone in jail. And here's a fantastic summation of the series and how it's all about family. I don't have friends. I got family. No, this. Ain't that him? I don't take no dirt from a barmaid. That's him. Also, barmaid? Dirt from a barmaid. This isn't medieval times. I'll be your serving lunch, Melinda. Might I fetch you something from the barkeep? Bo and Luke are almost sprung free, but the bad guys bring in bad bacteria, causing the crew to quarantine. Why would anybody fake the plague just to stay in jail? Yeah, I know nothing about quarantining. <laughs> but the real trouble is that if Jesse doesn't get the money for the farm payment to some unseen guy who owns it, well, Hog will have it. Now don't panic, but get that mortgage money to Jason Higgins before midnight. You just take care of Uncle Jesse, and, and I'm on my way to the bank right now. However, Hog gets <clears throat> hogtied, so to speak, when Brainiacs, Enos, and Roscoe break the cell door. Yo, Pete Brainiac didn't have a death, you didn't love me! He, he did. All hope abandoned, you who enter here. Where'd you come up with that bit of sunshine, Roscoe? 
Oh, my sweet mama does needlepoint. I'm going to miss these subtle, mature moments when the show starts introducing aliens and shit. Tonight, on the Dukes, when a robot takes his job... <laughs> robot Beagle Roscoe drowns his sorrow. Let me the bottle. Bo and Luke Duke and Cousin Daisy will do anything for a good time, a good cause, or a good woman. Waylon Jennings tells the story of the Dukes of Hazard starting Friday, January 26th. Bouncing to the bank, these odd, somewhat twitchy fellas that have been sprinkled throughout the episode thus far make way with the money while dressed in a Laurel and Hardy cosplay. Here's yours. Thank you. And of course, Daisy and Cooter get wrapped up in it. Daisy. Oops. Once the jail is filled in on Daisy's current situation, they deduce that this sick sack is faking. Jailbreak! Eat us! So they break out, Jesse gets left behind, the super troopers shows up it seems, and they jump the car. This valley hop should get a counter of its own. They reuse this one a lot. It's no mystery why, it's awesome. Exactly on schedule, the third wheel takes all four, precisely as predicted, and Cooter gets en route to the hideout and himself kidnapped. It ain't gonna start no half. I hid the distributor cap right before I did them tires. <laughs> Kidnap the Dukes and what do you get? Bippity boppity boom. <laughs> This guy overacts the hell out of this episode and reminds me of a pimp porn star Dr. Evil. These people are crazy. I wouldn't have wanted the season to end any other way. This one takes the bronze medal of the season. I'd be lying if I said it wasn't like wearing a warm blanket coming back to this show that respected the audience as much as it did the cast and crew, crafting something that will never happen again. John Schneider and Catherine Bach, whose commentary on the pilot DVD was great, described the first season as swampy, and I couldn't agree more. It's grittier, has realer stakes, and has a lived-in feel that's fizzled out as the family hour for breezing sanitized a lot of the show. All in all, this was a tight 13-episode season with only a few duds alongside a bunch of brilliant stories, getting audiences used to this fantastical fuckery of the Dukes of Hazard. And I would rate the season as follows. 1, 2, 13, 10, 7, 4, 5, 11, 9, 12, 8, 6, 3. And with that, we move on to season 2, which is my absolute favorite of the bunch. I hear y'all are looking for hot drivers. Well, you can stop looking. I'm Confused Reviews, and thanks for watching. I wasn't looking for any flying saucers because I don't believe in them. <laughs>